um, tomorrow morning, okay, or actually later today when I post it. Um, you know my announcements show up in the courses normally around 4 o'clock every afternoon. Um, mm -hmm. So before you start anything tomorrow morning, I need you to make sure you read my announcement. I know that it doesn't always show up properly on the apps, so if you don't see an announcement pop up in front of you on the Canvas Student app, please go click on Announcements, read my announcements. It gives directions for some of the stuff on the exam. And um, there again, just to repeat, there is an exam tomorrow. Um, it, it does wrap up the classroom portion of this course. That's not the, um, not the shop portion, so the course isn't done. You guys still have shop to do for this course. But the classroom portion of this course wraps up with the exam tomorrow. Some people have been emailing me about assignment of the days they can no longer get into. Well, it's called an assignment of a day for a reason. Um, some of the assignments you can still <laughs> submit work for. Those assignments, if it's late, it's going to deduct points in accordance with the syllabus. Um, some of you have emailed me with specific reasons, and I've, I mean, again, depending on what the reason is, that's fine. But I told you from day one of this course, I don't accept people turning in all their work on the last day of the course. That's not happening. Mm -hmm. um, they're set out over the course of the course for a reason. The yep. other thing is you get two attempts on the exam tomorrow. First attempt, I would recommend you try to take it on your own. Don't use books. Don't use notes. Try to take a closed book. Second attempt, you can use available resources. Um, the system will automatically keep the higher grade. If you have questions, you have a problem with how it graded, send me a message. Okay? I need to know the question number, and I need to know why you think it graded incorrectly. I am not able to regrade exams while they're open. So you will not get immediate satisfaction on it, but as long as I have the message, I'll go back and look at it after the exam closes. Okay, what I mean by regrade, I can't change answers, add a second, answer, a second correct answer or anything while the exam is open. Okay, I do generally, after an exam closes, I do go back and review the results from an overall perspective. I get percentages of questions people got wrong. Okay, and I go look at those, and anything where too many people got a percentage wrong, I go back and I evaluate whether or not the question was worded properly, whether or not the question was fair. Okay, so that's, that's how I deal with that. But if you have any questions tomorrow on whether or not something graded properly, just send me an email, okay? Um, but don't panic if I don't get to it right away. Okay, because again, I have to wait for the exam to close before I can regrade questions. Anyone have any questions with that? No, sir. Okay, I think it's pretty direct, straightforward. There's no surprises on the exam, everything you've seen before. I actually think you guys are going to find it's pretty simple overall. Okay. Um, so I want to talk out about NFPA 31. What does NFPA stand for, anybody? Anybody know what NFPA stands for? National Fire Protection Association. Okay, what's important about them? What's, what, why do we really care about NFPA? Well, I really don't, but why do we really care about NFPA? It's all about safety. Yeah, it really is all about safety. NFPA is one of the code authorities. Okay, in other words, everything we do in this trade is based on NFPA code. Okay, NFPA 70 is the National Electrical Code. NFPA 31 tells us how we install oil burners. There's codes for the gas and everything else. Now, at the top of your course where I just clicked on a link up there near the top of the course. Okay, it's usually in the first section of the course. Okay, there's a link to all the online codes. There's a link to the online ICC codes, that's International Code Council. There's a link to the NFPA code as well. You can buy code books or you can use the online ones for free. Okay, I did do a video a couple years ago about how to use the online codes. The video's there as well. But both of these codes are 
it's all the code books that you need in this trade electronically and for free. Again, you can buy them so you can use them in an app or whatever, but the online free version actually works quite, quite well. Now, a note to students who are in Connecticut. Your Connecticut licensing exams are open code book. They have not allowed, as of yet, electronic codes. However, your apprenticeships are between two, three, and four years. So the code book you might be that's active in the state now is most likely not going to be the code book that is active for your licensing exam. I would highly recommend you wait until closer to your licensing exam to purchase code books. Okay, I would use the online ones until you get closer to the exam. Code books are expensive. Okay, you purchase the full series of code books, you're out of pocket close to four or five hundred dollars. So use the online ones until you know what version of the code book that you're going to be using. Okay, Massachusetts is a little bit different. They you the Massachusetts the Commonwealth of Massachusetts uses the they're usually on the most recent code book. But Connecticut is always a little bit behind. And by the way, Massachusetts, I don't think, allows open book code books into their exams. Um, Connecticut does allow you to have a code book, a specific version of code book with you to take your exams. Okay, but again, be aware, the code book today may not be the code book that's on your exam when you need it. Okay, so at the top of your course, there's a link to the different code authorities and the free code access. When you go to NFPA, okay, you have a free access page. You start off by um, basically going to the version of the code you want to access. Okay, what it does, it gives you a list of codes. They're in numerical order. It actually tells you what each and every single one of them is. Okay, by the way, installation of sprinkler systems, that's not the type of sprinkler system that waters your yard. Okay, um, this is to do all with fire protection type stuff. Um, when you scroll down here, okay, we're worried about for oil, we're worried about NFPA 31. We're also concerned about NFPA 70. Okay, NFPA 70 is National Electrical Code. But today I want a little bit talk about NFPA 31. There's some important stuff we do need to talk about a little bit. And it falls into all about safety and all about the proper installation of oil burning equipment. Okay, now, you, when you click on it, you, click, you want to click on the box for free access. There's no difference in the code for free access. Okay, it just is a matter of you're going to, um, it's going to give you like current and prior editions. Okay, so you're going to come down here, select the edition. Okay, um, the current edition is 2020, prior edition is 2016. Connecticut is still currently using the 2016, but I'm going to go ahead and go to the 2020. When you first open it, Okay, it's going to actually want you to log in. We hope. Okay, it's going to have you agree to some terms and conditions, you know, the stuff no one ever reads. And it's going to bring up the free code in a pop-up window. Now, the one problem with the online codes is that you are actually restricted from printing it. You can't print these things off the online unless you do a whole bunch of screen prints. You can click on the table of contents. Over on the right-hand side, it will pull up a table of contents. Now, the code books are arranged in what we call chapters and articles. Okay, so every single um, code book is sort of arranged the same one. Chapter one is always administration. Okay, it tells, it basically defines who is it, who's responsible for administrating it? It talks, talks about retroactivity. What, does it go backwards in time? Does this code override prior codes and stuff like that? 
It talks that chapter 2 always talks about referenced publications. It gives you the list of every single publication that this code book references. Okay, because code books sometimes reference a lot of other code books. Okay, chapter 3 in any NFPA code always talks about definitions. Okay, it will tell you what the different words mean. Now, there's two words in code books that we want to really make sure you have a clean understanding of. First, the word shawl, S-H-A-L-L. Okay, it's a mandatory requirement. You have no options on this. The word shawl is a mandatory requirement. Should is a recommendation. Okay, it's advised, but it's not required. Okay, so again, shawl means in the code book means you will do it. Okay, should, it's advised, but it's not required. Now, let me toss a question out there. If a building official says to you that he, he's not going to pass the job until you do something, and if it's listed in the code book as a should, not a shawl, what are you going to do? Hey, you listen to your supervisor. It, well, if a building official, if the building ah. inspector says that you need to do something before he passes the job. Well, then okay. you're just not going to. Well, that's tricky, I'd say. I mean, you don't have to do it, but, I mean, I don't know, maybe give the guy a little, a little green under the table. And yeah, just... we, don't want to, we don't want to do that, especially <laughs> since this session is being recorded. Um, the reality is, the building official in your town has the final word, okay? They're not allowed to go looser than building code, okay? Building officials do not have the right to take away from building code. But every town and every jurisdiction is allowed to add to the building code, if that makes sense. Mm -hmm. So if a building official says you will do something, and if it's listed as shawl or should rather than shawl, you're still going to do it. Okay? There's a rule of thumb when you get into this trade. You never argue with a building official. Just don't do it, if that makes sense. I mean, if the building official says jump, how high, sir? I mean, that's, that's the way it is. Because the building officials in your towns you work in can either be your best friends or your biggest nightmares. I prefer to keep them as a friend. Accessible, readily accessible, is another definition. Readily accessible. Can that term mean different th things during installation versus during when you're, um, when you're getting there to service it? If something's readily accessible during installation, can it be something different when you're ready to go out and service it? Oh, absolutely. Give me an example. Oh, that I can do. <laughs> what about if a boiler or, get, or an oil furnace is installed in someone's basement when the house is first being built, and then when you go back to service it, they've remodeled the basement and put the thing in a closet? Did my accessibility just change? Yes, it did, actually. Yeah, so Very again, diff different ways. Okay, so you just have to be aware that in code books, okay, Chapter 3 has a lot to do with basic, um, in other words, all the definitions are there. High pressure boilers, hot water supply boiler, low pressure boilers. Okay, all of this is there. It tells you what BTUs is, tells you different types of chimneys, tells you what a chimney connector is. All of the stuff in Chapter 3 is referenced further on in the code book. 
So you really do need to understand most of these definitions. And quite honestly, as an oil burner technician, if you need to go back and look at the definitions to figure out what things are, you probably need to review a lot of the stuff you've had in school by the end of the time you graduate, because most of it is covered. Chapter 4, always, is basic installation and operating requirements. Okay, it tells you exactly what is required. Okay, tells you basic installation and operating requirements of oil burning appliances. Okay, tells you that it has to be listed. Okay, approved equipment. Okay, so tells you what the plans have to be. Tells you what the instruction, what where the instructions need to be left. I think that last one four three two two is pretty interesting. Tells you the instructions have to be left with the owner. Okay, so it tells you exactly what is required. Okay, um, I was actually standing next to a, I was going through an inspection once, and the inspector turned around and looked at the homeowner and said, "Did he give you the operating instructions? Okay, do you have the manual?" Okay, fortunately, we always put the manual in a manual holder on the side of the piece of equipment, so it was always right there. Okay, um, it tells you where it can be installed. Okay, tells you, for example, three, 436 tells you oil burning appliances and equipment should be installed so that the, the minimum of three feet separation is maintained from any electrical panel and a minimum of five feet is separation is maintained from an oil tank. Why do we have a three foot separation from an electrical panel and five foot from an oil tank? What's the reason for that? I imagine that three feet from the electrical is for the electrician or the technician's safety. Got to um, be able to get to it, right? Yeah. As far as the fuel tank, uh, we're looking at uh, what was it? I just read That's it. Five, well, it's five feet separation. Five feet separation for no. Uh, ah, geez, geez, geez! I got it! I got it! I got it. no moisture. Um, something about moisture. Uh, what does NFPA stand for? National Fire Protection. Stop so right there. Fire I don't protection. want that oil tank to have be a risk of a fire if that furnace overheats, right? Right. That's your five feet separation. Oh. Okay. We want to keep it. We want to keep it five feet away from the equipment. If there's a fire, I don't want that to be directly exposed to the fire. Okay. Is that underground or above ground? Tanks? Above ground. It's an uh, unenclosed fuel tank. Okay. Okay, so that's above ground. Do we allow installation of below ground tanks anymore? No, I think that was a thing of the past, wasn't it? Yeah, they all have to come out. Uh, yeah, you can't, you can't do that anymore. So it tells you about the electrical service. Now, this is actually, again, remember, I said part of our job is an FPA 70. So... Here, we're right there referencing NFPA 70, okay? Tells us what safety control circuit should be. Two wire, not exceeding 150 volts, okay? All of that is part of what's allowed. Different types of fuel are all listed. Mentions UL standards when we come to using recycled fuels. Okay, and again, where oil leakage can occur at pumps, strainers, and burners, okay, all has to be provided adequate ventilation. Means shall be provided to safely dispose of oil spills. Okay, it even gives you nice pictures for those who cannot read. It tells you how ventilation openings should be into the combustion areas. Okay, so if it's in a confined space, which means like a closet, crawl space, or something like that, we have to have a bottom opening and we have to have a top opening. 
Okay, there's further on in the code, it tells us how big those openings should be. But basically, it's one square inch per 2,000 BTUs. Okay. And again, there's different openings and stuff like that. Tells you all about what has to happen during the opening or during the installation. Okay, now this stuff is important to you because if you go change a furnace out, okay, the new furnace, the new installation must match the current NFPA code. Codes change over time. Just because it was there years ago and has been working for 30 years does not mean you can go put the new furnace or new boiler in without making modifications to the installation. Okay, but so once, again, it's very, very important. Well, once you put in the new boiler based on the new code, it doesn't mean that you have to constantly switch it every time the code changes, right? That's correct. It's basically any time you pull a permit for an equipment installation or replacement. Okay. Okay. Now, if I go out and service something and see that there's an unsafe condition that's resolved in the new code, I can't tell the homeowner you have to fix it. But I might explain it to the homeowner and say, you know, it might be a good idea to fix this. Okay. Okay, because isn't safety one of our primary objectives? Yes. Okay, so if we want to move, if we want to make things safe, so for example, this picture that's on my screen right now, I know for those of you looking at an iPad, it's a little tough to see. This is all has to do with ventilation air. Okay, tells us how to bring in outside air. If I have an enclosed mechanical space with no outside air, or if a homeowner remodeled a basement and put a door in front of the furnace and walled it around with no outside air, okay, am I going to advise them that this is an unsafe condition and is going to cause them problems, and am I going to do that in writing and tell them how to fix it? Yeah, I'm going to. Because someone's going to die over the carbon monoxide that's going to eventually build up. Okay. But can I tell them they 100% have to? No. Okay. Because it's an existing installation. Now, if I find out that there was a general contractor involved in putting up, in remodeling the basement, and a general contractor put the walls up and enclose the oil furnace. Is there a different situation there? I would think so. I mean... Yeah, there's a big difference between the DIYer, okay, and a general contractor. If a general contractor came in and remodeled the basement, there was a permit pulled, okay? If an unsafe condition was caused because of a remodel that a contractor did, okay, before I talk to the homeowner, I'm picking up the phone and I'm calling the building office and finding out who the contractor was that does it, and I'll offer the contractor the option to refix that before I approach the homeowner. Okay, the contractor may not know. Okay, so you have to give them the option at least, right? I don't have to, but, you know, working, keeping a good relationship with the trades is right. usually a good idea. Okay. So I'll, I'll call the building office, and I'll find out who the contractor was, and I'll say, hey, listen, when you put that wall up there, this is what, you, this is what was caused. And, you know, nine out of ten times, oh, can you fix it while you're there? We'll take care of the cost. Okay, occasionally you get a guy, well, that's not my problem. Okay, now I guarantee it will become his problem after that because I'll call the building office back and told, tell them what I found. Because there's okay. no reason a homeowner should have to pay for something that a contractor did. Right. Okay, so again, the basic requirements are all in Chapter 4. Chapter 5 gets more critical. It talks much more about the air requirements for furnaces. Okay, it talks about 
what the per BTU, per gallon, okay, of oil requirements are. Okay, we have to have an opening of no less than one square inch per 1,000 BTUs per hour of oil. Okay, which is 140 square inches per gallon per hour of oil. Okay, that's what I have to have if it's in like if it's in a closet or if it's a com any confined space from inside the building. I have to have that much air. Okay? Now, if I have outside air directly to the outside, like it's an outside wall, I have to have, okay, either if it's a vertical duct, I have to be able to pull one square inch per, per 4,000 BTUs or one square inch per 2,000 BTUs for horizontal ducts. So, again, depending on how the installation goes, I have to have a certain amount of outside air. Okay, so that's all in Chapter 5, and it's laid out pretty nicely. It's very hard not to have the information you need there because it makes a lot of sense. Venting of combustion and flue gases is all in Chapter 6. It tells you exactly how the ventilation should be. Okay, it tells you exactly what you're allowed to do with the chimneys, the flue pipes, and the connectors. We're going to talk about that quite a bit more in the next portion of this course. Okay, we're going to talk about chimneys. But it tells us even what gauge metal I'm allowed to use, what my diameter is for certain gauge metals. Okay, it tells us what type of venting systems we're allowed to use. That's all in Chapter 6. Chapter 7 is all about the oil tanks. Okay, lists a lot of UL, which is Underwriter Laboratories. Tell us about what the fill openings are. Tells us what our requirements for tank design is. Okay, tanks are very, very, very critical in oil because you can have an environmental spill as well as an explosion hazard. Okay, so we just need to be aware, okay, that tanks have operating pressures. They can't be over a certain pressure. They're not the sturdiest things in the world. They're designed to hold liquid, but not a pressure. Okay, so they have pressure reliefs and everything else like that. Okay, so tanks are a big issue. Okay, tells you what size tanks you're allowed to have. Tells you how fire doors have to be around there. Tells you that each tank has to be equipped with a separate fill and vent opening. Has to have a gauge. Okay. And it even gives tables along the way. Tells you how you can remove oil tanks. Do you know when you remove an oil tank, it has to be actually permitted for removal? Okay. You have to pull permits to remove tanks. Tells you what type of pipe fittings you're allowed to have. Okay, and that starts coming in Chapter 8. Tells you how things can be piped. Okay. Tells you what you can't use for pipes tells you exact sizes, and so on and so forth. Okay, Chapter 9 goes even further. Talks about oil distribution systems. That's the lines coming from the tanks to the units. Okay, now it even goes up to 20,000 gallons of capacity for underground tanks. Okay, but again, it tells you exactly how you can pipe these things. Tell us whole section on underground tanks. Okay, remember that 10 inches of vacuum I told you about yesterday? Okay, when fed directly from a storage tank, the fuel supply system should be designed, or shall be designed, so that the burner fuel unit operates with less than 10 inches of vacuum at the inlet under normal operating conditions. So even though a pump can sometimes handle more than that, the code says that it's 10-inch vacuum. So I don't care what the manufacturer says. I care what the code says because the code has a tighter number than the manufacturer does. Okay, so again, it tells you exactly what is allowed and what isn't allowed. 
in the average company, who's responsible for making sure things are installed according to code? Who's responsible? The technician installing it. Yeah. A lot of people think that the contractor, the guy designing the system, the salesperson is responsible for code. No. You, as a licensed technician, bear the entire responsibility of making sure it is installed according to code. Okay, yeah, the contractor should be giving you the correct parts. Your boss should be giving you the correct parts, giving you the correct instructions. But you are responsible for making sure things are according to code. It's a big part about having a license. Okay, so again, we go through there. We go through Chapter 10 starts talking about installation of burners and oil burning appliances, including water heaters and everything else. Okay, chapter 11 talks about oil burning stoves. Hope you never see one of those. Kerosene burning room heaters. Okay, and portable heaters. Okay, talks about outdoor appliances as well as indoor. Okay. Chapter 12 talks about used oil burning appliances. In other words, if you buy, if your customer buys a used appliance, okay, that, um, or if it's used oil burning, okay, appliances that burn used oil. Where, what is used oil? Where would we get used oil? Uh, your that cars? cars? Yeah, that's motor oil. Okay. Could also be lately oil from McDonald's. Okay. Any used oil. Okay. Has to be very specifically designed. Okay. The, you can't use a standard burner. It still has to be installed according to other clearances. Okay. In other words, it references you back to the install, installation clearances and stuff like that. But again, there's special operating requirements. There's pumps and valves. There's special strainers required. Notice they talk about Environmental Protection Agency in this one, okay, because you have to follow EPA regulations. Chapter 13 gets better. A lot of large commercial installations have combination burners. They'll either burn gas or oil. Okay? They could either burn gas or oil. But it basically says right at the top of this, 13.1.2, oil and gas burning appliances should shall be used only in commercial 400,000 BTU per hour or industrial applications and installations. So can Joe homeowner burn gas and oil at the same time in their furnace? <laughs> yeah, it sounds that way. No. It's not there the average residential it doesn't fall in residential. It says very specifically commercial or industrial. I can't burn natural gas and oil in a residential piece of equipment. Okay? So again, the important part of this is that you will never have oil mixed with gas. They can't be burning both at the same time. It's either, but it can be used one piece of equipment. Make sense? Yes, okay. sir. Now, the, the, every code book has annexes. Okay, that's sort of like the appendix in a different type of book. Okay, annexes have additional material that is designed basically to explain the reasons behind the code. Okay, um, every code is developed because, some, because there was a reason. There was a fire caused by something. Someone did something stupid. Okay, so codes are basically created over the years because something happened that caused a safety concern. Okay, so everything in the code that has that sort of doesn't have an immediate reason that's obvious to the person looking at it. You look in the Annex A and you can find the explanatory material. 
Annex B, okay, basically goes further. It tells you additional material, like it gives you additional pictures. It tells you some considerations, like for alternative fuels. Okay, so like NFPA 31 also covers wood burning fuels sometimes. It tells you how to mix um, wood burning fuels with different. It tells you how to mix pellet fuels in with oil. Okay. Um, talks about things like masonry chimneys, new fuel burning appliances, the low, the high efficiency fuel burning appliances. All of this comes into um, the alternative codes and stuff like that. So that's all going to be in a Annex B. Annex C gives you pictures of the chimneys and the different vents capable. Okay, all of your chimney systems and everything like that are there. Again, another majorly important thing. Okay, why does it matter how far away from the ridge of a roof my chimney is installed? Why does it matter? That I do not know. So you don't get a downdraft in it? Yeah, so that's exactly right. Okay, if the wind blows the top of that across the top of that roof, if my chimney is not at least two feet away from the peak, okay, and basically two feet above the, you see the little two foot there above the maximum point and 10 foot this way. Okay, so ver vertically, chimney has to be two feet above the peak of the roof, okay, and then my chimney has to be a certain distance away from the ridge. Okay, so you got to be careful of that because if it's not that way, we're going to have downdraft problems. Okay, in other words, the chimney doesn't know if it's supposed to exhaust out or in. Chimneys aren't that smart. They can't tell you that. They just work on pressures and air. Okay, so we got to be very careful about that stuff. Okay, um, Appendix D or Annex D is um, non-petroleum fuels. That's where we can mix, um, like, wood and stuff like that into that. So we got to be somewhat careful about that as well. Okay, uh, Annex E talks about relining chimneys. Whole portion of this trade is how to reline masonry chimneys to make them work better. Okay, talks about what what is allowed. Okay, and Annex F talks about um, some additional publications and stuff like that. Okay? So all of this comes into play when we're dealing with installation or replacement of oil-fired equipment. So if you have a new oil furnace that you're basically replacing into somebody's house, and if the chimney does not meet current standards, what has to be done? has to be rebuilt either has to, has to be fixed or relined or rebuilt that actually happens a lot okay so it's very important for us to talk about chimneys and standards okay so again this was just an overview of NFPA code okay what I really hope everybody does is goes and follows that link and at least get yourself, the first time you log into NFPA, for you, the first time you access the free access, you're going to have to set up an account, okay, which is basically free. You put in your email address. It just verifies your email address. It sends you an email and says, click here to verify. Okay, the first time you go to NFPA, you're going to need to do that. In the next course, we are going to be spending on and off quite a bit of time in the NFPA code book. Okay, because a lot of what we talk about in the 215 course, which comes up starting Monday, we are going to be going back and forth to the code book to find where this stuff is referenced. And I'm sorry, we, no, you are going to be finding a lot of stuff in the code book. I already know where it's at. So um, at least 
someplace along the way. The link's at the top of the next course also. Make sure you log into that because part of your, a lot of your daily questions of the day are going to be referring to that code book. Questions on anything I just went over? Nope. Uh, I have one question. Sure. Uh, you mentioned earlier uh, that it's not recommended that we purchase the book or... There's a lot of background noise, so I'm having a tough time hearing you. I'm sorry. Uh, you recommended that we do not purchase these books if we wanted to until we're ready to take the test and we know which edition they're going to use, right? I do not, I do not believe that through your apprenticeship years, okay, because for those of you who are having it, it varies a little bit by state, okay? Um, right. I really believe you should be closer to the time you're taking your exam to purchase the books, okay? Um, I think you can use the online ones as a reference until that point. Okay. Okay. Um, I know other people have different feelings about that, but I just I just don't see a sense in you going out and spending a couple hundred bucks on code books overall and then having to re-spend a couple hundred bucks when it comes time to take your exam. To me, it doesn't make sense. No, you're right. Okay. True, true. Now, again, there are other instructors that do have other other opinions about that, that, yeah, you know, getting used to the paper book is great. Yeah, they'll be able to buy it on their own. They'll have money. But, again, I, I just think that knowing where the stuff is in the code books, you still know where it's at because you're finding an electronic version. It doesn't give it to you. You've got to find it. So, again, if you understand the chapters where things are at and if you understand the articles where things are at inside those chapters, once you get your paper book to do your testing, okay, I think you'll be way ahead. The other thing is that um, you're going to end up eventually where the, I'm hoping the state eventually allows electronic code books into the testing site, okay? I don't know when that's going to happen. I don't see them holding off on forever. Um, and it's again, it's just a matter of when you go take your exam. So again, um, that's that's why I have my opinion about when you should buy code books. Okay, that makes sense. You guys don't have a ton of money unless you've won the Powerball someplace or stuff like that, and I I don't want you to waste money. <laughs> sure. so, any other questions? I'm good. <laughs> Okay, I promised everybody that I would keep today's lesson short, and that's what I really attempted to do here. Um, tomorrow, again, the plan for the day tomorrow is very simple. We don't have an online session. You have an exam. Okay, I want to give you guys all the possibilities in the world to do well on that exam. The purpose of the exam is not to fail anybody. The purpose of the exam is that you actually all pass the exam, and we and you do well in it, okay? Passing an exam, doing well on an exam is actually for a lot of people is a pretty big confidence booster. That's my goal with exams. Can I give it to you? No, okay? It's just not the way education works. But do I want you at all to pass? Yeah. Will I have I found every reason to make sure you pass? Yes. Okay. Um, so having said that, that is basically all I have for today. I will hang out here for a few minutes because I know there's a couple people who wanted to talk to me individually about a few things. So I'm going to turn off the recordings off. If you need to talk to me about something, realize other people may be on the call. So probably grades is not a good discussion to have on this meeting.